here for worship today. Uh, at this time, we'll dismiss the children for the children's ministry. So if all the children, if you can go at this time. Why don't we pray together and we'll hold on to our message for today. Let's pray. And Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we, we invite you to do whatever you need to do in our hearts. And Holy Spirit, we know that you're here. We know that you have the power to change our hearts, to change our perspective from the inside out. So we ask for your power to work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, we all have an idea. We all have an idea about what love is. If, if I asked you what is love, we would all have some kind of image or some kind of concept in our minds. I don't know if you watch uh, Korean dramas, but sometimes my wife and I uh, will watch the most famous Korean drama there is. So we'll look on the, we'll look on the ratings and then uh, we'll look for what is the most popular Korean drama and then we'll watch that together. Uh, and part of that is because it's just fun. And the Korean dramas, if, if you've never watched a Korean drama, you should. They're, they're really well made, they're awesome, they're so fun. Uh, but one of the other reasons I watched it is because you learn a lot about the culture uh, by watching or, or, or looking at something that everyone enjoys in that country. So Korean dramas, they are super influential. So I watched them to kind of understand uh, what this culture is like. But when you watch Korean dramas, you learn uh, kind of what the Korean culture thinks about love. Uh, they think about love as this very powerful feeling. Right, that makes you do crazy things. It right, makes you even die for someone. Right? So it's a very powerful emotion that they show in Korean drama. A lot of emotion, a lot of you know, Korean drama, there's so much crying, so much screaming, right? It's very emotional. So love is this very powerful emotion that grabs hold of you, makes you do crazy things, and makes you say crazy things. Sometimes, you know, we, we look at love and we say love is the relationship between parents and children. How parents sacrifice so much for their children. Right? They, they don't live the life they want. They give up so many things. Or we look at love and we say love is about giving gifts. Right? Love is when uh, you receive or you give a really thoughtful gift. And others feel love when they are touched, when they get a hug. Or when they're embraced in some way, when they're near someone physically. Right? So there are different ways that we, we understand love and we express love. But when you look at our relationships, it's very clear that we're not very good at love. I mean, just think about your relationships right now. How many relationships do you have right now where you would probably say, that is not a very loving relationship? There is not much love there. I think we could all point to at least one relationship right now that we would say, I am not doing the love thing very well there. So even though you know, we, we, all, we all have an idea about love, uh, we're not all very good at love. Uh, many times we're, uh, we're terrible at love. And that is something that we can all understand. It's interesting. Love is, is so important to everyone, right? I mean, love, love is what drives so many of us. And yet, it's so hard to get at what love really is. Like, if I asked you, what is love? Uh, I think all of us here would struggle with that. And we would give some kind of answer, but I think all of us would, would have a hard time really capturing what love is, and yet it, it's what we all desire so much. When we look at this passage, uh, you know, it's a very famous passage. They read this all the time at weddings. We might think that the point of this passage is to learn 
what love is. And it does talk about love. But what I want us to see is that this passage is so much more than just a definition of love. What this passage is really talking about is how does the gospel change us? How does the gospel transform us? This is what this passage is really talking about. Now last week, uh, if you remember last week, I, on Easter Sunday, I talked about how the Apostle Paul went to incredible extremes to give the gospel to the church, right? To, to send the gospel. And remember that uh, I, I told you all the background that these letters that they send, they take like days and months and they're very, very expensive to send. They're very time consuming. So when the Apostle Paul sent a letter to a church, remember what I said? I said, he's not going to waste any word right? because every word in that letter is so important and it takes so much time to get there. And yet he spent a good chunk of that letter reminding them of the gospel that they had already received. And so it was something they already knew, but the Apostle Paul said, I'm going to use a big chunk of this letter to tell you again the gospel because it's that important. It's a primary importance. If you remember, he used those words, it's a first importance. So here's another reminder because I just want us to always be reminded of the gospel. That's what God wants. I want us to be reminded of the gospel. So the gospel is the good news that Jesus, the Son of God, he died, he rose again, and he restored our relationship with our Father in heaven, so that one day we'll be face to face with our Father in heaven, in the new heaven and the new earth, forever and ever. And that eternity starts now. Right? If you're a Christian, you are already living eternal life. That is the gospel, that is the good news. Now, maybe you've wondered at some point, what is the gospel supposed to do for me? What does it look like for the gospel to change me? What does it look like when the gospel is powerful in me? What does that look like? And what I want to do is briefly look at who the Apostle Paul is talking to in this passage. And if you look at this, uh, it's going to give you a better idea of, of what he's trying to tell us here. Now, uh, we need to remember that, as I said before, uh, each of these letters that the Apostle Paul sent, they were to a specific church or a specific community at a specific time to address very specific problems. So these are not general letters. They're not letters that he sends to everybody. This was a church in the city of Corinth, and he sent this letter to them for their problems. Okay, so you need to understand that first. And so, when you read this letter, you're going to learn what this church is like. What this Corinthian church is like. And what do you learn when you look at this passage? Uh, what you learn is that this church of Corinth was very gifted. They were a very, very gifted church. Why would the Apostle Paul mention speaking in tongues, the gift of prophecy, faith, radical sacrifice, giving all that you have for others, even dying for Jesus. Why would he mention all those things? Probably because that church had all those things going on. And probably because that church, that Corinthian church, had all those spiritual gifts, incredible works of the Holy Spirit, people who were dying for Jesus, right? That was all going on in this Corinthian church. Uh, because, you know, you have to think, if this church didn't have those things, then the people who are receiving this letter, so this is why it's important to know he's sending it to a certain group. The people who are receiving this letter, they could just say, well, we don't have any of those things. We don't have the gift of tongues here. We don't have all these things going on. So I don't know why you're, you're mentioning these things in this letter. It's not relevant to us. But clearly it was. Clearly, all these things were happening in the Christian church. So this was a very impressive church. You have to think about, this was one of those churches that everybody wanted to go to, right? This was a church where things were happening, 
powerful moves of God. But the Apostle Paul wasn't impressed. Instead, she's being very harsh here. It's a rebuke, actually. What does he say? He says, your gift of tongues, your ability to speak the language of angels and of heaven, it's just noise. Your ability to hear God's voice and to discern the mysteries of God, it's nothing. You do all these good deeds, you give to the poor, you even die for the faith. It's worth nothing. And do you see this? It is, it is harsh. An extremely harsh rebuke. And if you think about it, it's kind of insulting. I mean, think about it. Imagine if someone came up to you and they look at everything that you did for God, all the, the service that you did for, on God's behalf, all the ministry that you did, and they said, all your faithful servants, service, all your ministry, all the good things that you do for God, they're actually all worthless. They're meaningless. If someone said that to you, how would you feel? You, I think you'd be upset. I think I would be upset if someone said that to me. Why? Why is it that make you upset? Well, it's because we, we believe those things are valuable. We believe that the things that we offer to God are valuable, and they are. And we would wonder, how could you say it's nothing? How could you say uh, all that I do, everything that I've done for you, Lord, how can you say that all these things are worthless? They amount to absolutely nothing. Well, there's a very important message that the Apostle Paul is trying to send us. And uh, I think it's very important to see why he's using this very extreme language because it is so important to him that you really get this. It's so important to him that the church of Corinth get this and that all future Christians understand this. You see, he's making these comparisons to point out a trap that we so often fall into. A trap that many Christians uh, get caught in. Now I want to show you that in this passage, there are basically two divisions here. Uh, you can generally divide verses 1 through 3. So verses 1 through 3, uh, it talks about the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, uh, you know, incredible faith. All of these things are gifts of God. And when you get the gift of tongues, when you can speak a language that is not your own. That is a gift. You don't earn that. That is a gift from God. Also, gift of prophecy. When you can understand, when you look at someone, or you can tell someone what God wants for them, or you have a special understanding, special knowledge, that is a gift. Faith is a gift. So all these things are gifts. And then you also have, in the other verses, uh, you have service to God. Giving all that you have away. Dying for Jesus. Right? Those are what? Those are actions for God, serving Him. But how might you categorize verses 4 to 7? Well, the obvious label is love, right? Because it says love is this, love is that, love is this. But I'm not so sure that's helpful because remember what I said at the beginning, we all have some ideas about love. So when we hear the word love, you're automatically thinking about something. So I'm not going to use the word love here. But when you look at the words patience, not, not envious, not jealous, not rude, doesn't get angry easily, hopes for people, endures for people. What do you see here? What you get is you get a person of great character. If you add all those things together, that is a person of integrity. That is a person of character. This is a person who you can trust. Right? They, are, they are never going to let you down. They are dependable. They are patient. Right? They, they are faithful. They are not going to quit on you. Right? This is a person of character. You can trust this person. When they say they will be there for you, they will be there for you. A person of character. 
Now let's put all this together. So what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's saying, let's compare the gifts of God, the service that we do for God, and let's compare it with godly character. Do you see this here? He's making a distinction here. He's saying, on this side is the supernatural gifts of God, our service to God, and on this side, I want you to see godly character. And I'm going to make a comparison here. And this is how he exposes the trap. And I want you to see uh, how he does this. Uh, let's, say, let's say I preach a great sermon. Uh, and I'm, I'm just so happy about it. I touch the hearts of lots of people. Or let's say you are involved in some kind of ministry where you're helping a friend and you talk to that friend, you counsel that friend, that friend is really helped, they're, they're changed, right? They, they experience something in their hearts. Or let's say uh, you read the Bible every day of the week. Or let's say you went to worship faithfully, regularly. Right? Or let's say you went on missions of all of these different things. Let's say, let's say I performed a miracle, a physical healing for someone. Or let's say someone you know, or let's say you even, you look at someone and you're able to tell them how God feels about them. Now let's say you or I, and I'm just using these examples, let's say these things happen. Now, how do you feel as a Christian when those things happen? You feel great. When I preach a great sermon, I feel awesome. I feel happy, right? It, if you minister to someone and they were changed, you would feel great, right? You would feel happy, and that's normal. But, maybe for some of us, we would also feel, I must be really close with God. Like God is really walking with me. Or maybe we would say, you know what, now this is Christian success. You know, I finally healed someone, or I finally... I was able to minister to someone in this powerful way, right? I have Christian success now. Wouldn't we think this is proof that God is really working? I finally did this thing that I always wanted to do. I finally experienced this thing, this thing that I always wanted. Now, this is proof that God is really working. Wouldn't some of us think that? I would think that sometimes. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is, this is a trap. This is a trap. This is what the Apostle Paul saw in the Corinthian church. What they were doing was they were confusing the outside with the inside. And they thought that the presence of the gifts of God and the presence of the service of God, right, that that meant that there must be an equal presence of God working in their hearts. Inside a person's heart. Do you see what I'm saying here? Right? The people in court, they said, because all these things, the gifts of the Spirit, right, the work of God, all these things are happening on the outside, that must mean that there's an equal amount of stuff going on in the inside. That God must be working in people's hearts in the same way Have you ever been confused when you heard about great Christian leaders who are doing incredible spiritual work, even doing physical healings, have all these spiritual gifts, seem to know so many things, and then you find out that they had an affair. And then you find out that they were stealing money from the church. And then you find out that they were, that they were cheating the church in some way, that they were lying to the church, that they were living in sin. I've been confused by that. But there is a way to not be confused. To not confuse spiritual gifts and spiritual works with spiritual growth. They're not the same thing. That is a trap. So many times we think spiritual gifts, spiritual works equals spiritual growth. Right? If there is this much of that here, if a person has this much spiritual gifts, then that must mean that this person has this much spiritual character, godly character. But it's not true. And that is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Do not be 
fooled. Don't be fooled by all of this flash over here. That is meaningless. That is a trap. All of that, that is not what pleases God. I want you to look at the map that the Apostle Paul does for us here. He says, if you take spiritual gifts and you take great spiritual works, you add those together, but you take away godly character, then you are left with absolutely nothing. You see this map? This is a very important map. You need to understand this is an important equation. If you add all the spiritual gifts, the greatest spiritual gifts, and you add all the greatest spiritual works, even dying for Jesus, but you subtract godly character, you have zero. You see that math? This is gospel math. And it doesn't make sense to us. And it's very easy to get trapped in a different kind of math. But this is God's equation for us. Now, balance is important. Okay, I'm, I'm giving this extreme viewpoint because this is the way that the Apostle Paul was guarding against this abuse. But, let me say this. In other places, the Apostle Paul is very clear. He said, aggressively pursue spiritual gifts. He said, go after the gifts of God, especially the gift of prophecy. You must get that gift. It is an awesome gift. So, I'm saying... This is by no means uh, me saying that you should not uh, try to have all the gifts of God. Why? Because anything that's from God, you should want it. Right? There is, if, if anything is related to God in any remote way, you should want all of it. Miracles, prophecy, all of those things. You should want all of it because it's all from God. It's all good. But the Apostle Paul is clear on what is truly valuable. Now, what are some things that we can take away from this? First of all, uh, if you struggle with wondering, why don't I experience more of God's gifts in my life? Right? Why don't I have this spiritual gift? Or why don't I have this happening to me? Why is this miracle happening to me? Does that mean there's something wrong with you as a Christian? Or maybe you've been told that something's wrong with you because you don't have those gifts. Or because you don't have these certain things happening in your life, what you need to understand is there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. Spiritual growth, spiritual maturity, Christian success is not measured by the presence or the absence of spiritual gifts or spiritual works. That is not how God measures. Let's remember this. The Pharisees, during that time, they were the most successful in accomplishing spiritual works. They were at the top. Like if you want to point to who is the best at doing works of God, they were on the top. And Jesus said, you are complete failures. You have failed in every way. Uh, my, my wife, this is something that maybe I shared with some of you, but my wife, uh, her, her grandfather is a, a famous pastor. Uh, he's a very famous revivalist pastor and preacher in Korea. And uh, one of the things that I was surprised to hear uh, is that even though he performed very, many miracles, right, this pastor, he has, he has performed all these miracles for people, and yet, he never received the gift of tongues. Something wrong with him? Right? Did he, did he sin in some way? Why does he have all the gifts of God? Right? I don't know. He doesn't know. He doesn't know why he didn't get the gift of tongues. He got many other gifts. He didn't get the gift of tongues. One of my favorite pastors, uh, I mentioned him before, Pastor John Piper. He is a well-known theologian probably one of the greatest theologians of our time. He doesn't have the gift of tongues. He wants it. He prays for the gift of tongues. He 
doesn't happen. Now, do I measure Pastor John Piper's spiritual maturity based on that gift? No. I look at his character. What kind of man is he? That's how I see his spiritual maturity. Secondly, knowing this truth will help you to really know how to make God happy. Uh, if you love God, if you are someone who says, I love God, and you're always trying to find out, how can I love, love God better? Uh, you know, if a husband, if I as a husband, I no longer care what my wife likes, or uh, I no longer pay attention to her hobbies, or I no longer pay attention to uh, the people that my wife really cares about. If I say, you know, I don't really care about that. I, I, want, I want what I want. If I say to my wife, I don't care what you really like or what you really love, then you could rightfully say to me, I don't think you really love your wife. Right? Showing my wife that I love her, uh, one way that I do that is by constantly figuring out how can I love her better? How can I grow in my ability to love her? How can I find out more about what she likes and what her hobbies are? Right? That is what I need to do as a husband. So if we love God, we need to be constantly thinking about what does God like? You know, what, what, does he, what kind of activities that, does He enjoy? Uh, what will make Him happy? And our passage today tells us that what makes God happy is when we focus on the inside and not the outside. It's when our attention is on our hearts and not what's going on with our actions. God cares far more for who you are than what you do. God cares far more in your being than in your doing. This is, this is how God is. You need to understand this about God in order to really make Him happy. So, how do you measure the power of the gospel in you? How do you know the gospel is really working in you? It's really, there's a powerful thing going on in you. How do you know that, yes, God's gospel is working in me and that power of the resurrection is at work in me? How do you understand that? You see, when I was a young Christian, I was mostly dazzled by miracles. I was so impressed by miracles. I mean, that's normal, right? Miracles are, are amazing. Uh, I was impressed by spiritual gifts. I was impressed by very powerful preaching. I was impressed by big numbers. I was impressed by very flashy presentation, right? Those are all the things as a young Christian that I was impressed by. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect in any way, but I've grown in some ways, and now I look for two things only. I only ask, when I look at someone, I ask, how does this person treat other people? How does this person treat other people? And how does this person relate to God? That's it. I don't care, I really, I don't care if they can do miracles. Uh, that's great. Again, uh, I don't want to have any misunderstanding here. I am thoroughly for miracles of God, and I want them to happen more and more and more, but I'm not impressed by them. I mean, that is not what really impresses me. I'm not impressed by flashy preaching. I'm not impressed by big numbers and great presentation. I'm impressed by character. I want to see, I want to see how that person treats other people around them. And that is what impresses me. A pastor once said that whatever impresses you uh, has the power to influence you. If you are greatly impressed, far more impressed by the supernatural works of God than by the character changes that the Holy Spirit is doing in you, then that is what will mostly influence you. That is what your Christianity will look like. What are you most impressed by? What is it that you get most excited about? That reveals a lot about what is influencing your walk with God. So these are questions that I ask. I just look at someone and I say, is that person kind? 
Is she patient? Does he struggle with jealousy? Does she always tell? Is she always talking about you know, how she did this or she did that? Or is she very humble? And she doesn't really tell other people about what she accomplished. Is he rude? Is she rebellious? Does she not like listening to authority? Does he get angry easily? Does he have a temper? Does she get angry about the right things? When something is very wrong that God would be angry about, does she get angry about that also? Is he faithful? Is he trustworthy? Does he keep his promises? Is she consistent? Is he a person who is constantly seeking to make more and more commitments, to grow in that area? That's what I ask. That's what we need to be asking. That is what we need to be impressed by. Kindness, generosity, humility. You know, this is a very powerful illusion breaker. It's so easy for us to think that I have grown as a Christian because I have listened to a great sermon. Right? Is that, it's very easy. You, know, you, go, you go to a service, you listen to a powerful sermon, and you're like, oh, so blessed. And you think, I have grown, right? Because I was so blessed, I was so inspired, that was such a great sermon. Or let's say you received a miracle of God, and you think, oh, God is with me. I received a miracle. Or let's say you read the Bible all week and you're like, oh yes, I'm walking with God because I read the Bible all week. And let me be clear, God can and will use all of those things to change you. And He will use all of those things to lead you. But the real proof of change is not in those things by themselves. What is in that? By themselves, that great sermon, that incredible miracle, all that Bible reading, by themselves, it's zero. But if you add godly character, then you get everything. Now the best is you have both, right? You have the spiritual gifts, you have the spiritual work, and you have the godly character. I mean, then you are doing really well, right? That is where God wants you to be. But if you just have the spiritual gifts and the spiritual works and you think this is it, you don't have anything. Relationships keep us honest, right? Uh, when we really ask, am I patient with that person? You know, right? You know, you know how patient you know the ways that you've been impatient. Or when you ask, was I rude to that person? You know how rude you've been, right? It's, and you can't, so we can lie to ourselves and read the Bible, right? We, okay, I read 50 chapters this week, right? And you can deceive yourself into thinking, I grew by 50 chapters. I listened to a great sermon. I grew by a great sermon. I went on a mission. I grew by a great missions trip. You can't really lie to yourself when it comes to how you treat other people. Right? We know. We know when we haven't treated someone well. It keeps us honest. So now we're clear on our mission. Right? Uh, we've got to do better about this love thing. Right? Love, godly character, this is it. Right? The Apostle Paul is very clear. If you don't have this, everything else is zero. Right? If you don't have this, Nothing else matters. So we've got to somehow increase this, right? We've got to increase our patience. We've got to increase uh, our, our generosity, our humility, our, our ability to be faithful, right? So we look at this list and we're like, all right, I gotta be more generous, I gotta be more humble, I gotta you know be more kind, and, and all of these things, and there's so much in here that we're so bad at. But that is not the gospel. The gospel is not you look at that list and you're like, okay. I gotta do all these things step by step. That is not the gospel. The gospel is not a story of what we did for God. 
saying, God, okay, I checked out everything in this list about love. No, the gospel is a story of what God did for you. That is the gospel. The gospel is always God's story first, not your story. Sometimes we don't like that, but that is actually the way it is. It is for His glory. God did all those things for His glory. Yes, He loves us, but God is the main character of the gospel. He is the main character. And we receive what the main character accomplishes on our behalf. And so the same applies here. See, we say God is love. We say, the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. It's love. Then, verses 4 to 8, where it says, love is, love is patient, love is kind. All the verses are talking about a person. It's a person. It's not a list of things that we're supposed to accomplish. Right? We don't look at that list and say, all right, kindness, okay. Five, I, I think I gained about 5% in that category. All right, uh, humility. All right, I think I was 10% better in that. No, it's not a list. It's not a checklist. It's a person. Love is a person. So in the end, we're not dealing with emotions here. We're not dealing with even actions of love. That is not the, the reason for all of this here. Though love can be expressed in those ways, you can express love through your emotion. You can express love through your actions. But the purest definition of love is that love is Jesus. That is the purest definition of love. If God is love and Jesus is God, then when we look at Jesus, that is love. It's not what you see in Korean dramas. Uh, it's not all these other definitions we might have. It's not some uh, definition that was in the dictionary or in psychology. Love is Jesus. Love is God. And the Gospel tells us that love came down. Came down to meet us as a human being. So we did not have to reach up with our love and say, God, okay, I'm going to build up my love so that I can reach you somehow. Okay, God, you want me to love this much, so God, or I'm going to build up my love so that, okay, now I can reach you, and now I can get your love. No, it wasn't like that. It's God said, I know you can't love. I am love, so I will come down. I will give you myself. We need to understand that love came down to us first what, when we were still enemies. Love as a human being in the form of Jesus came to us first. We did not go to Jesus first. He came to us and loved us first. So what does this mean? It means Christianity is far more about what we receive about what we can give. Do you get that? Sometimes we get it switched around. Christianity is far more about what you have received because love came to you first. It is far more about what you receive than about what you can give. If you focus too much on what you can give, you will mess up everything. You will totally misunderstand the gospel. In some ways, if you want to be a good Christian, you have to be really good at receiving from God. You have to be really good at receiving His truth. You have to be really good at receiving His love. Because if you don't have any of those things, you're left with zero. You can have all the best spiritual gifts. You can have all of the greatest skill sets. You can have all the great spiritual works. But if you don't have God, you have zero. So you have to get good at receiving the source of love himself. So the reality is, if you are not full of God, you will not love others properly. Because you will use other people to fill the emptiness in you. This is why all love in some ways is selfish. All love in some way, uh, we're trying to benefit ourselves. 
But if you have God in you, the more that you have God in you, the purer, the purer your love is. Less and less do you use other people selfishly in your love. And you're able to love truly, sacrificially, truly looking for the benefit of others, not yourself. But if you're not full of God, you will be selfish in your love. You will try to use other people. So I just want to end with this just simple uh, description of Jesus to remind us of who He is. Uh, Jesus was the embodiment of love. Jesus was kind. Jesus was patient. Jesus did not envy. He was not rude. Jesus, He will always hope in you. He will always seek to build you up. He is always faithful. And Jesus will never leave. He will never quit on you. He is consistent to the end. This is Jesus. This is who He is. This is who we need. So what does that mean for us to do? Our calling, our greatest calling, is to just meet Him. Our calling is to just encounter Him. And it's in that that the power of the Gospel really works in us. Let's pray together.